Então vamos continuar e temos agora um convidado. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes, I can indeed. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. Um, um, I'm sitting in for Nurse Katerina. We yes. made the invitation for you. She she couldn't be here today, That's unfortunately. Right. Uh, but we're very happy to have you with us uh, this afternoon. Lovely, thank you. Um, uh, um, professor David Evans is professor in sexualities and genders, health and well-being at the University of Greenwich in London. He's a registered nurse, worked in HIV inpatient care in the 1980s. He's a former Roman Catholic priest and has been teaching nurses and other health and social care professionals <coughs> since 1990. He has a number of honors and awards, not least the National Honor of OBE from Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for services to nursing and sexual health education. He has published widely, especially on the topics of today's presentation, and spoken at conferences in a range of countries around the world. So it is our uh, honor to have you with us today to talk to us about HIV and the impact on sexuality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed. And I must start by apologizing that I can't speak to you in Portuguese. Thank you so much for letting me speak to you in English. Uh, if any of you are using Twitter at all, feel free to post me messages or, or questions as you wish. Um, th there's my Twitter account. And what I've been asked to do today is to look at the impact of HIV on sexuality. But especially because this afternoon's session has been focusing on mental health and well-being, including some materials on stigma from Anna as well, then what I'm planning to do with you here is look at the impact of HIV um, uh, the, the, the impact of HIV on sexualities, but through the lens of stigma. OK, so looking at it that way and you'll notice that I put HIV and AIDS separately, because especially when it comes to stigma, um, what I'd like to share with you now is that it's probably quite different whether it's directed towards people living with HIV or those who have got an AIDS defining illness. And I noticed from one of your earlier presenters um, about the statistics here in the UK. And yes, most people living with HIV have uh, been tested and therefore they know their diagnosis, but there are very few that haven't. And we sometimes refer to those as late presenters, people who turn up at hospital with different types of illnesses, which are then diagnosed as an AIDS defining illness with underlying HIV. So I'd say that the stigmas are different. And then especially when we're looking at this, round about the time of HIV diagnosis or an AIDS diagnosis. So that's what I'd like to explore with you now. So that word stigma, just to make sure we're all with the same understanding of this, the word stigma is an ancient Greek word that literally means a mark or a sign. So the very fact that I'm wearing glasses is a mark or a sign. It's a stigma. But it was back in the 1960s when the Canadian sociologist Irving Goffman defined or redefined stigma as a situation of the individual who is disqualified from full social acceptance. Now that's an early definition from the 1960s before the word AIDS was even invented and before the virus HIV was even discovered. But when Goffman was talking about it, look how his notion of stigma and um, a lack of social acceptance can be placed on people because of their genders. So in many parts of the world where men dominate over women, then being a woman is a, a, a mark of discrimination for some. They don't have equal rights. And then look at people because of different, especially minority sexual orientations or minority genders. So therefore, stigma already existed for many people before the notions of HIV and AIDS even came along. And what's happening now is that lots of these different stigmas are intersecting one with the other. Um, in the UK in the 1980s, and you can still see this on YouTube if you type in AIDS, don't die of ignorance. That was the early television campaigns from the British government in the 1980s. And they're horrible campaigns, horrible images that wouldn't be used again, especially not today. 
but the health secretary at the time was somebody called Norman Fowler. And over the decades, Norman Fowler has become a wonderful advocate for people uh, living with HIV. And in 2014, he wrote this book, playing on the title of AIDS Don't Die of Ignorance. He says now, AIDS don't die of prejudice. And that very much taps into the whole notion of stigma. But after Goffman discussed stigma in the 1960s, some other people, Edward E. Jones and a team in America, they came up with this notion of concealability, to conceal something, to hide it. Concealability and the course or the outcome of this. Now, obviously, that's going to be very different um, from whether a person's diagnosed as being antibody positive so if they're diagnosed, they know something about themselves, but they may decide to keep that concealed or hidden. But what's going to be the outcome of that? Whereas if somebody has an AIDS-defining illness, especially if it's something that's visible, that others can see, that in itself will be outing them. So the course of that um, stigmatising condition then is very, very different. Um, in a book chapter I wrote on the stigma of sexuality, um, there was a lot of stuff in there that I wrote about the different types of isms. So whether we talk of sexism, which is usually one gender over another, so maybe males over females, so sexism, or heterosexism, or then the different types of phobias, whether it's homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, or even fear of sex, erotophobia. And erotophobia may be something that people newly diagnosed with HIV may go through a phase of. They might be frightened of sex if they've only had the stigmas of HIV, if they've only heard of um, what it was decades ago. And if they haven't updated their knowledge since, they may be living with outdated knowledge of HIV. In which case, once they're first diagnosed, an impact on sexuality might be that they're frightened of having sex, maybe frightened uh, in case they pass the infection on. So there's lots of ways in which stigma can impact on people. And um, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, he spoke about it, not so much as concealability in course, but he called it a triple, a three, a triple edict. And he referred to that as something which is taboo. So all the stuff that we're talking about now in relation to HIV or AIDS, gay sex, injecting drug use, all the different uh, um, aspects of people living with HIV that are impacted on negatively by stigma can be seen as taboos. And in which case, if something is taboo, maybe many people don't even talk about it. So there's silence around that. And if it's silenced, then other people may say, well, does it even exist? If nobody's talking about it, how do we know that it even exists? So it's important to think of that concealability and course. Now, moving on from the, uh, uh, the notions of HIV and stigma, let's look at those in relation to sexual orientation and gender identities, or the expression of all of these. And it's really important for us to realise that the world is not one thing or the other, black or white, straight or gay, uh, positive, negative because that's one of the problems in our world, is that we tend to see things very simplistically as either one thing or the other. And that can have real problems, even if we use words, say, for example, innocence, which I'll come and explore in a few moments' time. And even when we're using words like sexuality, it's important for us to realise the different dimensions of sexuality within each one of us. So it's not just, oh, someone's gay or somebody's straight, someone's bisexual. It's not necessarily just using a label like that, because for some people in some parts of the world, they might not even be able to express their sexuality. So it's important for us to consider here people's sexual orientation. Then they may have a label for that, an identity, which may or may not match. Say, for example, if they're living in a culture or a part of the world where it's not allowed to be anything other than heterosexual, then for them, they even have to be secretive or, you know, the concealability about their own sexual identity. But their sexual attractions may be different 
to what their identity is. And then it's really important when you think of sexual activities or behaviours, especially if a person can't talk openly about their sexuality and their sex lives, it may mean it's concealed and therefore that can add to the burden and add to their risks. So, linking all of these together with this term intersectionality, um, and it was Professor Kimberly Crenshaw from America who first used the term intersex intersectionality, and what I'm suggesting here is that we think of the whole mix of genders, orientations, HIV, put those together and consider the client you're working with, the person who is the centre of your care. Now, I've just mind mapped this with just ideas, but th think about it in relation to your each, uh, each of your own individual patients or clients. Think of that person and consider all the ways in which sexuality, sex, uh, um, safer sex, orientations, all of those things come together and in relation to their HIV status or um, an AIDS defining illness. Because for some people, some of these aspects can be rather burdensome. They can be heavy weighing on the person. And Susan Sontag, back in 1991, she came out with this wonderful little saying where she said, innocence by the inexorable logic that governs all relational terms su suggests guilt. Now, it sounds very difficult to understand, but basically what she's saying is if we use the word innocent, and certainly in the UK, in times gone by, many babies that were born with HIV, maybe the daily newspapers would refer to them as innocent or innocent victims. But if you call one person innocent, then silently what you're thinking, the opposite of innocence is guilty. And so many people living with HIV have to struggle with this burden that some people may think that they are guilty. Even when individuals ask someone with HIV, how did you get it? Basically, it's none of their business and they shouldn't be asking those questions unless it's a clinician. But what happens is people may want to judge whether a person is innocent or guilty, and that's burdensome for individuals. And again, it was Michel Foucault that asked, why we still burden ourselves today for once having made sex a sin? And when you think that HIV is predominantly um, seen as a sexual issue, then so many cultures and religions throughout time and uh, across the world have often had ways in which they consider certain aspects of sex sinful, or psychologists and psychiatrists have seen um, aspects of sexualities as deviant and in some cultures even criminal. And when you think of this, this is the added burden that someone living with HIV may have to contend with and therefore that idea of concealability, of hiding it, needs very, very um, gentle and careful management. Because the trouble is that if people um, perceive stigma and discrimination coming from others, so it may be from individuals, even individual healthcare professionals, or it may be in our cultures or religions or within our institutions, the problem is that can be internalised within the individual. And if it does, then it can have a, a negative impact on their mental well-being, especially from the point of view of low self-esteem. Because if somebody's feeling really low about themselves, they don't care. Oh, I don't care. Do whatever you like to me. And that means that they could be putting themselves at risk. But if they're putting themselves at risk, they're also potentially putting partners at risk as well. But on the one hand, they feel low about themselves. They might also feel that they're desperate to be loved and accepted and they may be frightened of being rejected. Now, those three things together can form a really um, heavy impact on a person's uh, uh, mental well-being. So, the final section of this is to look at yourselves. How can you help with all of this? How can you turn any of the negativities around and to be posit positive with it? So, it's over to you, to, for you to think what difference can you make in a person's life? Now, we haven't got time to go through the six questions that I've got on the screen here, 
But let me just sum up with these last few. First of all, consider each and every person you're working with as individual and unique. And for so many of them in relation to HIV, they may have questions about sex or about sexuality, about risk, about safer sex. So really important for you to be at ease in talking about sex. And if you find it difficult, look at ways in which you can overcome that difficulty so that you can be positive in talking about all these different aspects of sex, especially in relation to people living with HIV. And that means you may be dealing with individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. You may be even working with some of your other healthcare professionals. And maybe you notice that they are stigmatising of others and you need to challenge this. Or it could be that you're having an impact on your institutions, whether your own health services or maybe even your professional organisations. And really important then to normalise HIV so that it's just like any other illness and when people go to their healthcare professionals they may say oh I've got diabetes, I've got depression, I suffer with epilepsy, why can't HIV be normalised just as the others? So it may be when you come across stigma you need to challenge it and whether that's in individuals, it could be the clients themselves, or it could be in health professions, but also to educate, because if lots of your colleagues learnt about HIV three or four decades ago, their knowledge is very old fashioned, and it will be heavily laden with stigma and discrimination. And look at ways in which you can influence your own healthcare organisations and your own societies. And that may even be writing in newspapers or speaking on television. Look at ways in which you can advocate for and be allies with people living with HIV. Okay, I can see I've gone 48 seconds over time. Thank you all so much for listening and I hope I haven't spoken too quickly for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Evans, for uh, leaving the questions. We have still one more presentation. Yeah. Questions at the end of the discussion.